good morning. We're glad you guys are joining us here uh, today. My name is Jared, um, and if we haven't had a chance to, to meet, I'd love to meet you before you, you head out uh, today, but uh, it's a great day to be here. Uh, we're going to finish up a series we've been in, in the, the book of Luke, where we were walking with Jesus for a little while and stopping and listening to some of the teachings that he teaches to the crowd and some teachings that he teaches to the disciples. And we're going to end up today in Luke chapter 11, if that's where you want to turn there or click over there on your Bible app. But I'll, I'll be, let me pray for us and then we'll get started. Father, as we open your words together today, we pray that you would speak, that we would listen, that we would do what you call us to do. And uh, Father, that, that my words would be Yours, spoken in uh, your truth and your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was an uh, eighth grader, uh, it was 2000, and the 2000 elections were happening, and within the first couple of days of school, uh, the, well, who would eventually be, but at that time, candidate for vice president, Dick Cheney, came to our high school for a campaign stop. So they bust everyone over to our high school, and uh, everybody was in there packed in like sardines. Uh, we had no air conditioning because our basketball coach believed that it made us tougher. I think it made us a hazard. But anyway, that, no air conditioning. Everybody's hot, dripping with sweat. And, of course, he's like the last seven seconds of this huge rally that happens. But uh, they had some high schoolers get up and ask him questions. And I felt so bad for these high schoolers because there, there's everyone, literally everyone in the county is there. And it's on like CNN, there's cameras pointed in their face, and they're up there and they're like doing this thing with the question, and they're sweating, and they're stumbling over their words, and, and I felt so bad for them. And then I learned later they didn't even write those, those were given to them by the campaign because they already knew the answers to them, and so they weren't even their questions, and they were just so nervous to speak to this big crowd and to ask the question to somebody who who actually would go on to be the vice president of the United States. You know, so many times we think, well, if I ever had the chance, I'd go talk to this person and, and ask them this question. But if they're really famous, there might be a, a chance that you just show up and go, uh, and not say anything, because we, we tend to be like that when we get in the presence of somebody that, that's famous or that, that a lot of people know. And that's what makes it so amazing, the fact that a bunch of fishermen, a tax collector, a zealot, and some people we have absolutely no idea what they did, got to go and hang out with the God of the universe for three years. They got to go walk with him, to talk with him, and ask him all sorts of questions. And one of those questions that they ask him is what we're going to look at today. They ask him a question, he gives them an answer, and then he teaches them a lesson based upon that. So Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus was praying, and, and Jesus prays all the time. If you read through the scriptures, if you read through the gospels, those four, four books that are specifically about Jesus' life, you see all the times, not necessarily the words that Jesus prays, even though we see that, but just how many times Jesus it said Jesus went off to pray. Jesus went off to pray, pray. Jesus was coming back from praying. Jesus prayed all the time. And the disciples took notice of this, and they go up to him, and they say, okay, teach us. Teach us how to pray. Obviously, you're good at it because you do it all the time. So can, can you teach us how to pray? Because here, here's, here's the deal. John, who's John the Baptist, John, he taught his followers to pray, and we would like to. It's kind of like the kid coming home, going to mom and be like, you know, they got a puppy. Why can't we have a puppy? You know, like that type of thing. And so, you know, John taught them to pray. Why can't you teach us to pray, Jesus? And so, and so Jesus says, okay, I'll, I'll teach you how to pray. And what we're going to do is we're going to break down what he says. And it's not even going to be verse by verse. Sometimes it's going to be word by word, but it's, it's going to be helpful for us to see Jesus' answer. And so they say, Jesus teaches to pray, and Jesus says to them, when you pray, say. Now there's a, a couple things I want us to note before we move on. The first thing is, what Jesus is about to say is not how every single prayer has to go. Jesus is not saying every single prayer that you pray has to be these exact words. If that was the case, then the prophets, a lot of the, the other people throughout the Bible, they wouldn't be good prayers. In fact, Jesus would be considered a bad prayer because a lot of the prayers that we see him pray don't fit this mold. But what Jesus is saying is when you pray, let me give you, because you want to be taught, let me give you a little outline here. 
All right, so this, this, is, this kind of this helps you as you learn how to pray to, to, to put things in, in these orders and things to highlight. And so that's what Jesus is doing. But the second part that we miss out on because we have an English translation of, of, of the Bible is that Jesus, even though it looks like he's talking to someone individually, Jesus is actually talking to a group. So if this was like the Kentucky edition of the Bible, he would say, when, you all, when y'all pray, right? When y'all pray, this is what you need to do. He's saying collectively, you, you pray. You together. When you corporately pray together, this is, this is how I, I want you to do it. This is, this is a way that you can do it. See, we have to understand that prayer is not just an important part for our individual walk with God. It's also really vital to our corporate walk as the church. Communal prayer, to, to community prayer, is really, really important. In fact, I saw a guy looked into this, and, and he found that 37 times Jesus teaches about prayer in the Gospels, and 33 of those 37 times, it's y'all that he's teaching to. You all. Together. 33 out of 37 times. It's you all. Listen, this is how you're going to do it together. And we see that they took it to heart. If you look through the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, there's 120 people praying in a room when the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. We see that when they know they have to replace Judas as a disciple, they they pray together. When Peter and John come back from the Sanhedrin with a report like they jailed us, they threatened they're going to beat us if we, if we continue to do this, they prayed. When there were needs that needed to be met in the Christian community and the apostles were overwhelmed and they said, we got to have some help, they prayed for, for help and they prayed together. When Peter was imprisoned by Herod, the church fervently prayed for him. When Paul and Silas were together in prison. They prayed together, and there was an earthquake which led to them being able to witness to the, the man that was supposed to keep them in the jail cell. The early church knew, they understood that prayer was a vital part of this community called the church. And if they were not praying together, then they, they might actually start doing things on their own without God's guidance. They wanted to be guided by God. They wanted to be shown where to go, what to do. They wanted his blessing, and so they prayed. And somewhere over the course of these 2,000 years, this communal aspect of prayer has become something that has kind of get pushed to the side. So much about our, our talk and, and so much about our spirituality now is, is this individual spirituality. And, and by all means, we're the only ones whose decisions and about Jesus, it, it, that's, that's what we're accountable for. But, but we've lost track of the fact that this is supposed to be together. There's an evangelist in the 19th century by the name of Charles Finney, and he says, Nothing tends to more cement the hearts of Christians than praying together. Never do they love one another so well as when they witness the outpouring of each other's heart in prayer. He says, listen, when, when someone's praying and, and you see their heart, that, that unites you. It, it, your love grows for them. And so one of the things that we... You may look at our service and you're like, well, we, we pray together. Like we pray kind of at the, the beginning and communion and scripture and all this other stuff. We, we kind of pray together, but, but we need to be praying with each other. We, we, we need to be a church that prays with each other. And so we, we, we want to be that going forward um, because this is a, a spot that we're, we're not, just to be honest, we're not doing great at. And, and so we want to do this going forward. And so we want to kickstart that with something that we're going to do this weekend. Uh, this Saturday, October the 2nd, is a significant date in this church's history. It's the date that the first worship service was done. October 2nd, 1983 was kind of like the founding of East 40 Church of Christ. And, and so with that anniversary coming up, what we want to do is beginning on Friday night at 5 p.m., going through Saturday night at 5 p.m., we want to do 24 hours of prayer for this church, for our community, for our world, and everything like that. We're going to have stations set up here in the auditorium. We're going to have kind of prompts. And we're going to ask you to go sign up on the Welcome Center as you leave today for a time slot. And say, you know what, I'll come. 
in their hour time slots. And some of you are like, I fall asleep after five minutes. What am I going to do for an hour? Let me tell you, well, first of all, don't get like the 3 a.m. one. But secondly, we're going to have scripture. We're going to have all these guides. We're going to have all this stuff for you to come. But uh, another thing is there's two, two slots per time, uh, for, for time. And, and I, I just want to encourage you that as you leave here today, you grab somebody and say, hey, we're doing this. We're going to do 7 o'clock p.m., right? The earlier you get, the less likely you're going to get to get the 2 o'clock a.m. one, okay? But we want, we want to pray, and we want to pray together. We want to list some needs that, that we are praying for in our community, some people we're praying for. We're going to, we're, we're going to talk about um, you know, praying for the future of this church and, and everything in between. There's going to be a whiteboard sitting up here where everybody who comes is just going to come write a name or a situation that they want prayer for. And so we encourage you as you leave here today to go and to sign up to pray and to grab somebody else and pray along with them for that hour. We're also asking that if, if maybe you want to pray, but you also want to help in some way, if you want to just kind of like watch the parking lot, and daylight hours are, are one thing, but you know, especially when the sun goes down, just watching the parking lot, make sure everybody gets in and out safe, then come talk to me uh, and we'd love to, to sign you up for that. So we, Jesus says, this is how you, you all need to pray. This is, this is a way for you to do it. And we want to reclaim that this morning, that we want to be a people who pray together. And so Jesus says, when you all pray, this is what you need to say. First, he says, Father. He, he says, when you start praying, he says, start by saying, Father. Guys, I don't know if you know this. It's, it's kind of a well-kept secret. Some of us have differing opinions than others. Do you guys know that? You know, okay. I, I didn't know. I mean, it's not a big deal or anything. But, like, so we, we, we have different opinions on some things. And anytime you're in a community, you're going to have a lot of different opinions on things. And Jesus says, when you start, you say, Father, because it reminds you that you are praying with your brother or sister in Christ. It reminds you, I mean, he's got a tax collector and a zealot who would normally hate each other in his disciple group. And he says, Father, Father, remember that you're united with him. And not only that, remember that you get to come to talk to God, not as a stranger, but as a child. You're not coming up to some nameless deity and throwing up something against the wall and hoping that it sticks. You come to someone who has sent his son to redeem you, and you can just say, Father, because you're family. That's what Paul says in Romans. He says, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And Ab is not a word that we use today. It's an it's a, it's a actual, actual word that, that is in the original language. So the best thing that we can come up with is, is basically like daddy. Like you, that intimate relationship between a father and a child. And, and he says, by the Holy Spirit, we get to come to God and say, Father. Father. He says, so when you pray, you remember this. You're, you're praying to your father and you're praying with your, your brothers and sisters continues on. He says, hallowed be your name. There's a good chance that over the course of your life, uh, the Lord's Prayer is the only time that you've ever said the word hallowed. It's not really a word that we use uh, a lot of times or any time. And when I was little, no joke, when I was little, I had to ask my parents what, why we talked about Halloween every single Sunday at church. Because we would come together every time we did the communion, and we would get the hallowed be the name. I'm like, what? It's not even October. What are, what are we doing here? Because hallowed's not a word, but, but hallowed is, is kind of like sacredness, or, or more exactly, like exalted. Right? It's exalted. And, and so when we pray, when Jesus says, when you pray together, remember that God is greater than everything. That God is higher than everything. And I want to pause here and, and make a point why... And I don't know that Jesus was correlating this exactly, but, but I, I do need to stop it. Because there are some of you, when I say you address God as Father, you already started having reservations because your relationship with your earthly father is tension-filled or maybe non-existent, and you've always struggled with that. 
because you, you haven't experienced that. And you look around, you see all these other people with great relationships, and then you come to God, and you're supposed to call him Father, and, that, and it's really hard for you. I think how will be your name reminds us that we're not praying to someone who's like our earthly father. Even if our earthly father, we think they're the greatest in the world, they have the mug and everything, that, that they're, they're awesome. We're praying to someone who's perfect. He, he, he's the perfect father. And so we can say, Father, even if we have this really strange relationship or really complicated picture of an earthly father, because he's exactly what a father should be. And not only that, he, he's greater than anything else. It's a reminder to those who are praying to not put our hope in anything else, not a leader or a government or, or a person or a preacher or anything else. We're not, we're not relying on anybody else because you are greater than everything else. And you know what? God's greatness doesn't depend on our circumstance. You read through the Bible and you see a lot of different people in a lot of different situations, and yet they come to God and they acknowledge His greatness. The prophet Jeremiah more than likely dealt with depression, anxiety. If you read the book of Lamentations, you can see that. He wrote that. And yet, in the midst of all that he had to go through as somebody who was persecuted for being a prophet and everything, he says, no one is like you, Lord, and your name is mighty in power. And then there's David, who did a lot of great things and then did a lot of really dumb things, too. And he says, how great are you, sovereign Lord? There's no one like you, and there's no God but you, as we have heard from our own ears. See, these two very complicated people were able to come and say, God, you're, you're, you're greater. You're greater than all of it. You're, you're, you're the name above all names. He says, so when you come together, remember your family. Remember that you're praying to God, who is your Father, but is also greater than anything else that you can ever imagine. And he says, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. And this is a reminder that our heart beats for the same thing that God's heart beats for. We want to see God's kingdom at play in the world that we live in. And I'll just be honest, I think that especially churches in, in, in America have relied on other entities to try to do what the church was always supposed to do. And so we've prayed, God, send this leader, God, send that person, God, let this pass, instead of saying, God, we're your church, we're plan A, there is no plan B, show us where you want us to go. Tell us what you want us to do. When we play your kingdom come, we say, God, I want to see your kingdom at work. I want to see your love, your compassion. I want to see your justice. I want to see, I want to see holiness. I want to see your kingdom here on this earth. But then it takes us and it places us into it and says, okay, and use us in whatever form to make this work. In whatever form to make this possible. When we, when we pray this, we remember to pray that God's will is done in the world and through us. We're not just saying, God, hey, can you fix that? Hey, God, can you fix that? We say, God, show us how we can fix that. Show us what you want us to do here. He says and continues, give us each day our daily bread. He says, when you come together and you pray, you pray, give us each day our, our daily bread. And now let, let's just get something out in the open like, this isn't asking God to set his Alexa reminder to provide for us every day, right? Because God just does it. God says, I, I clothe the, the flowers in the field. I got you. I feed the sparrows, and I care so much more about you. You're, you're good. It's actually a reminder for us. It's a reminder for us that he's where we go to for each and every day. That he's got us. That he's got us taken care of Remember that God provides what we need for every day, individually and as a church. I feel like so many times when the church gets together, they complain about how hard it is and how the world's mean to us and all of this stuff, but we don't come in and say, God, you got us taken care of, so just show us what we need to do. Just show us what you need to do. 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Paul got it. He says, God's got you, so you just do what he calls you to do. Something fell in your office, Heath. <laughs> or it's haunted. One of the two things. Um, then he continues on. 
He says, forgive us our sins. We like that part. For we also forgive those, forgive everyone who sins against us. Not so much that one. Jesus says, as you pray, you pray for forgiveness. Because newsflash, you're going to mess up. Individually, you're going to mess up. Corporately, you're going to mess up. There's going to be times that even though you, you feel like you're doing the right thing, you're not going to do the right thing. And there's going to be times that you don't care about doing the right thing, and you just keep doing it. And, and so you come to God and you say, forgive me. But then Jesus ties it in with, as we forgive those as we forgive everyone, not just the people that we end up liking, but everyone who sins against us. When we pray this, we remember that forgiven people forgive people. That's the, and, and it's not optional. If we follow Jesus, that's not optional. We, forgiven people forgive people. We have been forgiven for something far greater than anything has ever been done to us. And so we forgive because we have been forgiven. Jesus says in Matthew 6, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. He says, listen, I'm not, I'm not speaking high. Per- I'm serious about this. You have to forgive people. If you, if you are forgiven, you must forgive others others. And so when we come to God and we say, God, forgive me for doing this, this, and this, and then we leave out the part, God, help me forgive this person who wronged me, then we're actually leaving out part of the equation. Just come in and remember to forgive as you are forgiven. And then Jesus says, and lead us not into temptation. This is a little bit like the give us each day our daily bread. God doesn't need a reminding on this. that James tells us that, that God does not tempt us. God sent Jesus to come and die for us so that we could come and have a relationship with him. He's not going to then come around and be like, let's see how much you love me today. And I'm going to put this in your way and this in your way. He's not going to do anything that drives you away. All of that comes from the evil one who puts temptations in our lives and says, you know, oh, no, God says this is right, but this is right. Do this. Do the, and, and that comes from him. And so when we come to God and say, lead us not in temptation, God's like, oh, thanks for reminding me because I was going to lead you off a cliff today. God, this is a reminder for us that God is the one who needs to guide us and that he won't lead us into temptation. That God wants to guide us. Friends, every time that we have sinned, every time that we've gone off a path that we were supposed to go off, is the time that we took a step away from where God was leading us. Where we took the lead and expected God to follow instead of the other way around. God wants to guide us. He knows what's best for us. Psalm 23 is a beautiful psalm, but you also know that God leads you through some darkest valleys. And I know I don't trust myself in navigating the dark valleys. I don't even do well when it's daylight. And so God wants to guide us, and this is a prayer that we pray together as, as a community, and says, God, as a church, as brothers and sisters, anytime we step out of line, we know we're going to mess it up. So help us to fall in line. Now this is, if you grew up saying the Lord's Prayer, you're like, hey, there's a lot of words missing here. My Bible's messed up. What's wrong with this? That's in Matthew. The, the Lord's Prayer we're familiar with, that's in Matthew. This is Luke's account of this in a different teaching. But Jesus says, that when you come together, this is, this is what you should pray. For. This is how you should pray. These are things that should be on the forefront of your mind. And then he uses that answer to teach. He says, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. Jesus is referring to something that was uh, in uh, that. Half asleep or fully asleep. All right. And he comes to you at midnight and he says, I need to feed this person who just showed up. So apparently they have that friend too who just showed up and they're hungry. So they're teenagers. And we need to, to 
to get him food. I don't have any food. Do you have any food? Now, Jesus is saying this is, just imagine the scenario. And we would be like, this is a crazy scenario. We would just get on Amazon or go to the grocery and we would take care of it. But in this time, it was kind of Middle Eastern culture. Somebody shows up to you at your door, at your door and they say, I need this. You get it from them. And so he's, he's using a very real analogy. And then he says, and suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. That would be me, just to be completely honest with you. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. That is also me. I can't get up and give you anything. All right, so that's his answer. He says, leave me alone. But then look what Jesus says. I, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, so he doesn't like you that much, yet... Because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So Jesus says, here's the deal. He comes and he, you knock on his door, you wake him up, he's, he yells at you. Don't bother me. Leave me alone. I'm asleep. My kids are asleep. If I get up and my kid wakes up, then I'm not sleeping for the next three hours. So I'm not getting up. And they're going to turn around and they're going to go to bed. And then there's going to be this like thing that starts creeping into their mind. They're like, oh, he probably really needs food. He's here at midnight. Oh, I don't like him. But I'm going to go get it home. He says, because of your audacity for showing up, they're going to go, they're going to get the bread, they're going to give it to you. And then Jesus says this. So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks find, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus says, that's God. If you come and ask, you're going to receive. If you come and seek, you're going to find. If you knock, the door is going to be open because God, I just taught you about prayer. I need you to know that when you pray, that God answers. I need you to know that. I'm not just giving you this formula and you say, this is your best shot, and if God's not busy and the answer machine doesn't pick up, no one has answer machines anymore. But if, 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 if God's too, not too busy, he might answer you. He says, listen, God answers. Now, Let's just talk about uh, an elephant in the room for some of us. You would never be so bold to call the God of the universe a liar. But you might think he's bending the truth here. Because there's some of you who are here today, and you would say, some of you watching online, and you would say, I asked, and I didn't get it. And I have searched, and I'm still searching. And when I knock... I still see the ceiling above my head, and it feels like that's what I'm talking to. And you say, so seeing this, I'm not calling Jesus a liar, but I'm also, something must be broken with my connection because it's not working. I think that there's a lot of us, if, if not most of us, who may have been there at least some point in our life, and there's some of us who are here today. I have prayed, and I have prayed, and I have prayed, and it didn't happen. And that's really hard for us. That's really hard for us. All was great to see all these different ways that God wants us to pray, but <laughs> if it's not connecting on that other end, then what's the point? And that's what Satan wants to do. Satan wants to take that time that you asked for something and you didn't get it to say, see, God doesn't care. See, God doesn't love you. See, God's too busy. But I think there's an illustration I, I want us to see, and, and it's not going to be on the screen, but in, in the book of Revelation, there's this part where, where this bowl is brought before God, and this is, it's, it's, it says it's, it's incense. And it says it is the prayers of God's people. It's the prayers of the martyrs who died for God. And so in this bowl is every, how much longer do I have to deal with this? It's every, why do all these people who don't know you succeed 
and I'm having a hard time. Every, hey God, are you even listening? Every prayer that we look at in a broken world and we say, God, why? How? What, what is going on? And then John, who's singing this, says, it is poured out. And you know what happens next? God starts the process of making all things new. And he gets rid of all sin. He gets rid of death. He gets rid of Satan. He gets rid of all evil because he answers the prayers. But guys, here's what I need you to understand. That happens at the literal end of our, what we know of as concept of time. But God does answer it. Tim Keller has a quote, and it's really helped me, and so I hope it helps you. When he talks about God answering prayers, he says, we can be sure our prayers are answered precisely in the way we would want them to be answered if we knew everything that God knows. If we knew what God knew, we would see, yeah, I probably didn't need that. If we knew what God knew, we would say, yeah, you're right. That wasn't the best answer. What I prayed for wasn't the best answer for that relationship and that situation. If we knew what God knew, we would say, you know what? Yeah, you've got that. That's completely right. And so that's where faith comes in. And, and so even if God didn't answer the way that we want him to answer, or even if we're still kind of searching we still pray and we ignore what Satan is trying to put into our heads because we know that God does answer and his answer is always right. And the reason we know we can do this is what Jesus closes out with here. He says, Which of your fathers, if your son asked for a fish, would give him a snake instead? Or if he asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask you? Here's why we keep asking. Here's why we keep knocking. Here's why we keep seeking. Because, friends, the one who opens the door is our Father. And He knows what's best for us. And He's always going to do what needs to be done. So here this morning, we want to come before our Father. We want to come before our Father, and we want to, to knock. Now listen, there, there's some of you here that you don't even have to knock. Like, you haven't left the room. Your prayer life, you just keep praying. And, and it's fine, and it just keeps... There's going to be some of us today who are going to be like the, the, the prodigal son who ran away, and then we're going to come up, and we're going to have to knock on the door that we probably slammed shut at some point because we were so mad. But I promise you that he answers. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend a couple minutes here this morning. We're going to pray. And maybe you look through and you pray through this Luke 11, or maybe you already know what you want to pray. And I would encourage you here to make sure that other people are comfortable with it, whoever you're asking, but that you pray with somebody else this morning. That you come and say, hey, can I pray with you? And so here, I don't expect it to be quiet in here for two minutes if people are praying together. But today, Jesus says, when you all pray, this is what I want you to do. And so let's be obedient in what he's calling us to this morning. So let's spend the next two minutes now in prayer by ourselves, or grab somebody else and pray with them here this morning.